I was 13 when this happened. My parents left on a business trip to L.A., so I had to stay home. My dad gave me his card so that I could order whatever I needed, so I kinda enjoyed being alone. And I wasn't scared because I've been home alone so many times, and besides, it was only for three days. Well, this was around the time the clowns were breaking into houses and doing some weird stuff. But they never came to my area since they usually hit more quiet places, especially the area near a forest. Although we had a fence that could easily allow someone to climb over, we didn't really think much about it because the area where we lived in was very safe. Anyway, it was around 6 p.m. and this was in the winter so it got dark pretty fast. We had a glass room at the back of the house, also known as a conservatory, and it leads straight to the garden. The room was right next to the kitchen. I got a little hungry, so I went to the fridge, took out some snacks, and went back to the living room to continue watching TV. There was a roof on the glass room that intensified any sound that landed on top of it, even the gentlest drop of water. That day, it was raining heavily, so it was too noisy to hear anything except the rainfalls pounding on the roof. About a few minutes later, I was quite sleepy, so I decided to go up to my room and lay down. I was about to grab my phone and check my social media, but then I heard something drop really hard on something downstairs. It really creeped me out. I got really scared, but decided to go downstairs to check, thinking that it would be nothing. So I came out of my room, went halfway down the staircase, and looked down the hallway. The whole area was dark, but I knew that someone was standing there. I saw the back of a silhouette. I quickly went to my room, trying not to make any noise. Then I heard someone walking around the living room. I immediately called the police and whispered to the operator that I needed help ASAP. <coughs> but all of a sudden, I had a sneezing fit. I was so panicked at that moment, so I instantly ran to the bathroom since it was the only room with a lock. As I was reaching the bathroom, he sprinted up the stairs so fast. I locked the door and tried not to cry. The man tried to open the door. He kept turning the doorknob. The bathroom had a small blurry window, but I was able to see outside. So, just then, I got a glimpse of what was at the door. It was a clown, with green hair and without a nose. He was wearing a very weird outfit and was holding a gigantic knife. I had no other choice, so I quickly hopped inside the bath, opened the big window, and jumped out. I slid off the big roof and fell on the concrete. I couldn't even feel my injury because I was so scared. As I was about to hop on the fence, I heard the cops. They entered our house, and after that, they arrested and cuffed him. When he walked past me, I was so scared and my body was shivering. But I was glad that it was over. The police contacted my parents, so they came back home in a hurry. I would see them again, and I knew that I was safe now. From then on, I never stayed at home alone, and that clown guy was in prison for several years for scaring kids and for possible murder. This happened when I was 17 years old. I was a senior in high school. It was the middle of the week and my friends and I were chatting online about wanting to do something new and fun over the weekend. We usually just went to the movies, went to the mall or got dinner. And I thought we should try something different. The next day, I was in the computer lab for one of my classes and I had some time to kill because I finished my assignment early. Keep in mind, Snapchat and Instagram were just starting up and didn't have the same kind of popularity as it has today. So the only thing we really had at the time was Facebook. However, my school was strict and blocked Facebook, so the only thing I could really do was read articles on news websites. 
While searching and scrolling through the internet, an article showed up. It was about an interview with a man who was discussing the truth of paranormal activity around the area I grew up in. Intrigued, I read the article and looked up the places the guy was talking about. And sure enough, I found a bunch of things. One place in particular caught my eye. It was a place about 20 minutes away from where I lived. It was known to have multiple paranormal occurrences happen on the exact same road. As soon as class ended, I texted my friends about what I found, and we all agreed on going and seeing what this road was all about Friday night. Friday night finally arrived. It was me and four of my friends. Right before we entered the location, I parked my car and had my friend drive because we believed that if a guy drove, not much would happen. So she drove my car while I was sitting in the passenger seat. While switching seats, my other friends put baby powder on the top of my car because one of my other friends read that it helps people see when ghosts touch or brush your car. It started to drizzle a bit, which bummed us out because the baby powder would be washed away. As we were driving my car, we turned off the radio to make it more suspenseful. All of a sudden, we heard someone from a distance scream bloody murder. At that moment, I heard the sound of a car door trying to be opened as if someone was aggressively trying to get into my car. After that, we saw a police car driving so fast with the sirens on as if they were chasing someone on a major highway. The problem with that was the road was paper thin and had tons of sharp turns, so you couldn't go that fast without crashing into another car. Plus, the car didn't have any of the county police or trooper tags from the area I lived in. I knew that because my dad was a cop, and I saw all kinds of different cop tags in my lifetime. I was freaked out that those two things just occurred. We were all freaked out and drove to the nearest parking lot so that we could calm down. As we got out of the car, one of my friends started to freak out even more. The baby powder on the roof of my car was smeared, and it was all over my passenger seat side door. What was even more creepy was the fact that there were finger marks all over the door. Now, this wouldn't normally creep me out, but we were driving the entire time, and we all made sure not to touch the doors when entering the car. The strangest part was that the finger marks had no fingerprints, but were clearly shaped like a hand. It was as if someone was trying to reach for the door handle. Not only that, but we also noticed that there were fingernail claw marks on my door handle. This freaked me out because earlier I heard someone violently trying to open my door. In the next few days, we told everyone both online and in person about that night and how it freaked us all out. Then someone sent me a link to an article about the street we drove on and all the activity that occurred on it. But it wasn't the one I originally read. It was a different one. As I was reading the website, I started to notice that all the things mentioned also happened to me the same exact way that night. But what freaks me out the most to this day is thinking about what would have happened if I didn't have my door locked. Would the door have opened up? <laughs> A few days ago, I went to a Macy's store with my mother and son to go check out some jewelry. While my mom was checking out jewelry, I noticed an old man around his 50s come near us. He was about 8 feet from us. At first, I thought he was just a random customer checking something out for his lady or something. Then, from the corner of my eye, I noticed he was just standing there without moving and looking at us. It made me feel uncomfortable, so I turned around moving the stroller, which my toddler was in, because I didn't want him looking at my baby. I turned my eyes to look at him again, and I could see that he was just staring at me with a creepy look. He was staring at me and my baby, then all of a sudden, he grinned widely at us. The weirdest thing about him was that he was wearing women's shoes and a scarf, and also holding a dress in his hand. 
He opened his mouth and tried to say something. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but I could read his lips. I like you. I like your baby. I just thought the man was a weirdo. And then my mom also noticed that he was odd and creepy. He saw that my mom was glaring at him, so he walked away. But then he appeared on the opposite side of us and started staring at me again. This time he pulled his phone out and made it seem like he was about to take a picture. He was staring at us and his eyes opened widely. He was smiling like a crazy psychopath. That was enough. I wanted to go up to him and tell him to get away from us, but I had my boy with me and didn't want anything to happen, so I chose to just get out of there. I told a lady who was working there what happened. She said that she would go take a look at him. A few minutes later, she came back and told us that he was a customer who has been reported before by other people. My mom asked, Why hasn't he been kicked out then? The lady said, well, because he hasn't threatened or hurt anyone, so the store doesn't have a good enough reason to kick him out. My mom and I were pissed off, because obviously the man is just there to harass people. The lady then told us that he said something creepy to her and also made her uncomfortable. She told us that when she went to go ask him what he was up to, he told her that he went to the store to return a dress. He decided that he didn't like that he bought it for his lady. He told her with a smile, Yeah, I need to change quickly because she's cold now. My mom and I instantly felt so creeped out so we just left. What did that mean? Could he have been hiding a dead body back at his place? A few days later, and I feel relieved that the crazy guy didn't harm us. But I'm still wondering what he meant by, she's cold now. This story happened in the summer of 2017 when I was 10 years old. My older brother and I had a babysitter, and she was around the age of 17. Since my mom was home on Tuesdays, the babysitter would come on the other weekdays. Most days when she babysat, we would go to the neighborhood pool, hang out, and eat lunch there. Then we went back home and my mom would arrive a bit later at around 5.30 in the evening. On one Thursday, the day was just an ordinary one and the babysitter came around 8 in the morning. A few hours later, we decided to head to the pool and eat lunch. We all got ready and headed out the door. As I used to be a little paranoid back then, every time I went outside, I made sure I locked the door and would immediately turn the doorknob and try to open it to make sure it was locked. The door was definitely locked, so we walked to the pool and swam for a while. Then we ate lunch and decided to head back to the house. When we got home, I pulled out the key from my bag, but I noticed that the door was a crack open. I pushed it, and the door swung open. A little chill ran down my spine, as I remembered that I made sure the door was locked before leaving. My babysitter had a frightened look on her face too. But my stupid brother thought nothing of it and just walked right in, so we followed him. About my house, when you walk into the house, to the right is an entryway to the living room, and straight ahead is a hallway to the kitchen. The stairs are to the right of the hallway, and you can see the upstairs railing from the entrance. We walked into the kitchen and set our stuff down, and I went to go lock the door. After I shut it, I turned back around to go back to the kitchen, but something caught my attention at the corner of my eye. Looking up at the railing, I could see the silhouette of someone crouched behind a tall, narrow floor fan. I looked a little closer, and I could see their eyes. They were wide open and were staring directly at me. I was frozen in fear and couldn't move. 
All I could do was stare back at them, not knowing if it was a man or woman. My babysitter called for me to come to the kitchen, and the figure slowly walked into a nearby room and disappeared. I ran into the kitchen, telling my babysitter and brother what I saw. At first, they didn't believe me, but then, all of a sudden, we were all silent as we heard slow footsteps creaking from upstairs. She quietly grabbed both her phone and a kitchen knife and ushered us to the back door. She slowly turned the doorknob and tried to not make any noise while opening the door. We made it to the backyard and she was going to call 911 on her phone. But before she could, we heard a tapping sound coming from one of the windows on the second floor. So we all looked up and then we saw him. He was a man, late fifties, short black hair, eyes still wide open, staring at us. He was pushing the blinds out of the way, so we saw his face very clearly. We screamed and started running to the gate on the side of the backyard. The babysitter dropped her phone while scared, so I picked it up and ran behind her. I dialed 911, told them our address, and explained to the operator what just happened. She said they would be there in a few minutes, told us to go to a nearby neighbor's house and stay there until the cops arrive. We rang a doorbell a few times and one of our neighbors, who was retired, came outside. He let us in and we explained what happened as we were looking out of the window. Then we saw three cop cars pulling up and the cops were surrounding my home. Three cops headed in through the front door and investigated our house. We went outside to tell them that we were okay, and the other police officer started questioning us. Soon, the cops came back after finding nothing and doing a thorough investigation. They told us it would be best to not stay home, as the person may come back. So the babysitter said we could go to her house, which is about a mile away. Just then, we heard our neighbors screaming from down the street. A few houses down, a policeman's car was set on fire and was smoking a lot. The cops spotted a man running past the corner down towards the end of the street. One officer took us to the babysitter's house while the other three went after that man. We later found out that the man had gotten away so he never got arrested. Our parents arrived home as they were contacted by the police and freaked out. Later that night, we came back to the house and we searched the whole place to see if anything was missing. A cash box that was stored in my parents' bedroom was missing, but we didn't report it since the man was never found. I have no idea who that was or how he opened our front door. I still wonder to this day what would have happened if I never noticed the man. He could have done something to us while we were sleeping. I still feel uneasy sometimes when I'm home alone. It all started one summer afternoon in August. My best friend Mike invited me to his house. Mike was the type of kid you'd call a nerd. He always got good grades, wore glasses, had freckles, and believed in things like dragons and magic. One of Mike's favorite things to do was performing magic for me. Every time I'd come over, he'd perform magic. But this magic trick, though, would be the one that I'd never forget. When I got to Mike's house, he said, I have a new magic trick to show you, and it's the best one. He grabbed my hand and we went into the living room where he had a large box in front of his family photo. It was all four of his family members in that picture, Mike, Josh, and his mom and dad. The box was about his size so we could fit in it, and his older brother Josh was standing next to it. So I sat down on a couch and Mike started introducing the name of his magic trick. It was called The Vanishing. Josh opened the door to the large box where nothing was inside, and Mike walked in. 
After Josh closed the door again, he then said some weird words and then yelled, Poof! Josh slowly opened the box, and Mike was no longer in it. However, I was in the seventh grade, so I was smart enough to know that under the box was a trap door so he could climb down out of it. So I looked down at the bottom of the box, but to my surprise, nothing was there. No door, no secret, no mic. Just at that moment, my mom called and said that I need to come home right now. I said bye to Josh, grabbed my backpack, and yelled, Nice trick, Mike. Gotta go. Everything was fine, just until the next day. The next day, Mike didn't invite me, but I thought of going to his house again. I ran up to his house, stood in front of the door, and rang the doorbell three times. His dad came out and said, Oh, hello. Nice to meet you. He acted like like that he'd never seen me before. It was weird, but I asked, Good afternoon, sir. Is Mike home? Then I could see his confused face, and he answered, Mike? Who is Mike? I felt stupid at that moment, as if I had come to the wrong house. I then quickly asked, Your son, Mike. You have two sons. During explaining the situation, I felt irritated, so I pushed him to the side to get into the living room. Josh, I said, pointing to the photo, and my... And then my eyes widened. Mike wasn't in the photo. I was pointing to nothing, which would have been where Mike should be standing in that picture. I panicked, and I couldn't believe what was going on here. I then said, You're your son, Mike. He has good grades, and he's good at magic... Oh, the box. I thought that everyone was playing a prank with me or something, but he looked extremely confused and even terrified. He looked at me as if I was some kind of lunatic. So I ran upstairs to check the box, and I opened the door thinking that I must be dreaming. The room was full of bookshelves and beanbags, all in a circle. It was just a cozy reading room. I was horrified. I kept saying, no, it, it can't be, over and over. That moment, Josh came in the room. I thought, this is the last chance. I quickly took out my phone, thinking that I could remind Mike to them by showing selfies that I took with Mike before. However, just when I did, he was in none of the pictures. The one where I gave him a hug, where we went to the other friend's birthday party and took a picture with the clown, nothing was there. It was like he never even existed before, and I felt that moment was like a nightmare. To this day, there is literally no one who remembers Mike in my town. I still can't believe what happened to Mike, but I definitely believe that Mike is real, and he must be somewhere. My name is Kyla. This story is about a piano that was in my elementary school. When I was a kid, my friends and I used to record random videos in my school's basement. Most of the time, the basement's lights were off because hardly anyone went there. And the reason was that that place was scary and sometimes smelled really bad. The basement was completely dark. We slowly walked in the basement with our phone lights on. I was nervous, but my friends were already walking ahead of me, so I just followed them. We were a group of five, so I felt like I shouldn't be scared since I was with them. My friend Michael was in the front since he was the bravest and also the one recording on his phone. I was in the very back and holding onto my friend Kate's shirt. There was a room just beside the basement's wall, and inside of it was a grand piano. Nothing else, only the piano. We went inside that room first. We were all quiet, and you could only hear our heavy breathing as we walked through the basement. But we didn't hear anything. And then, out of nowhere, Michael said, Boring. It took us around three minutes to reach the end of the basement. Michael put his phone back in his pocket, and we all started walking back in the long basement. 
We finally returned to the main gate of our school and sat on a bench. Everyone was focused on Michael as he pulled out his phone and started playing the recording. It was quiet at first, and then all that could be heard were our whispers as we tried to figure out whether or not we should continue with the recording. And then, all of our eyes widened when we heard a sound coming from what seemed like just beside the basement. We couldn't believe what we just heard, so we paused the video, rewinded it, and played it again. The sound came from the grand piano. It was playing a creepy song, and at that moment, Michael almost dropped his phone. We were all shocked and scared. We didn't say anything for a while. I'm 100% positive that we didn't hear that piano playing as we walked through the basement. It was definitely quiet. And the scariest thing was that the piano was still playing when Michael said, Boring. The recording was around 3 minutes long and when the recording was done playing, we were all speechless. This was many years ago. But to this day, I still don't have an explanation for what happened. Maybe someone went to that room and played it, but if so, why couldn't we hear it while we were walking through the basement? We also didn't see anyone else down there. And why did we only hear it when we played the recording? I am still confused about that incident. This happened in the middle of last year. At that time, I was at home with my boyfriend, Dan, watching TV. Dan was deeply concentrated on what the TV screen was showing, so I was about to start making a romantic atmosphere. But then I heard a knock at the door. I got pretty pissed off as it interrupted, but got up anyway and opened the door. We lived with one of our friends, so at the moment, I thought it would be my friend. But to my surprise... It was a man around the same age as me. He looked a little bit tired and was forcing a smile on his face. He was all sweating and his eyes were red as if from crying, but it wasn't my business to ask. Oh, hello, the stranger said with the wide smile taking his hand out for me to shake. Hi, I said, looking at his hand and back at him. Can I use your bathroom, please? He asked still having this huge smile plastered on his face. Before I could say anything, though, Dan came behind me and told the guy that, indeed, he could use the bathroom. The man went in there, and Dan and I just went back to the couch and waited for him. Then I heard some sounds, like water pouring in the bathtub. After ten minutes, I slowly started to get curious, as he didn't come out yet. I told Dan that I should check on him, but he told me to wait a little bit more. So, I just waited, and 20 minutes later, he didn't come out. There was just silence in the bathroom. After 30 minutes, well, Dan decided that he'd check the bathroom. However, having a bad feeling, I went along with him just to be sure that nothing happened to him. Hey, is everything all right? I knocked at the door at the bathroom, but there was no response. I repeated the actions, but this time I knocked louder and yelled. Dan told me to wait a little longer, but I refused. I pressed on the handle of the door, expecting it to be locked, but to my surprise, it wasn't. I couldn't believe what I saw in front of me. To my horror, there was blood splattered on the floor everywhere, and the bathtub was filled up with a red liquid, as well with a lifeless body in it. The smell of blood filled the bathroom, and I wondered how I couldn't smell that outside. I told Dan to call 911 while I went over to the body to check his pulse. But when I got closer to it, I noticed that a razor blade was shoved deep in his neck. He was just dead. After half an hour, the 911 arrived with the cops took his body and we had to give our report to the cops. To this day, I became more paranoid about a stranger. Especially, I'm positive that letting a stranger use your bathroom 
is not safe and just nonsense. So don't let the stranger come in. Ever. This happened to me last summer. My best friend and I went to Ibiza for a week. Once we checked into our hotel on the first day, we threw our bags in our room and drove our rented car to the nearest supermarket. On our way there, we talked about the hotel, which was located in the very old suburban part of the city. It was really dirty. It just had an overall weird vibe to it. My friend was really bummed out about it, but we agreed that it wasn't going to ruin our excitement for this trip. Later that night, around 3 a.m., after coming back from a club to the area where we stayed, we couldn't find our hotel. We were completely drunk and probably walked around the streets in circles. My friend laughed a lot, stopped, and then pointed at a tall garden fence. Through it, we saw the hotel building. It was right behind the garden, so without putting much thought into it, we tried to climb over the fence. My friend managed to succeed, but I fell and hurt my right leg quite a bit. He helped me up, and we stood in the middle of a bunch of green bushes. What the? My friend murmured all of a sudden. I looked up, and there were a bunch of tombstones. We were standing right between two walls, and at the end of the walls there was a small chapel. The door was wide open, and from a distance, we could see that it was full of lit-up candles. I was about to ask my friend why the lights were on, but that drunk idiot suddenly started to laugh and walked toward the chapel with big, awkward steps. Due to my injured leg, I couldn't really catch up with him. I almost felt like puking, so I looked down for a moment, and when I looked up again, he was standing inside the chapel. I took a few more steps and stopped as I saw his face look completely gray. What's wrong? I asked, but he gave me no response. Suddenly, he raised his hand and signaled that I should back off and be quiet. He leaned his face a bit forward, as if he was trying to see something in the room. At that point, I was really scared, so I just took as many steps back as I could while still looking at him. Then, I heard something. The sound of footsteps, maybe four or five people, was directly in front of him. He immediately turned around and started to sprint as fast as he possibly could while yelling, Run! Run! Go! I could hear the footsteps getting closer and closer, and whoever was chasing me was yelling some words in Latin. My friend caught up to me just as I was about to climb the fence. He helped me out and gave me a push forward. The footsteps were still right behind us. However, when we hit the ground on the other side of the fence and looked back between the bars into the green bushes, there was no one to be seen, no one to be heard. As frightened as we were, we glanced in every direction, looking for them, but there was nothing. We then got back on our feet and eventually went back to the hotel. Our legs were shivering. My friend entered the lobby first, and as I was just about to enter too, I looked back at the street we just came from and saw five figures standing in the darkness. They wore long black clothes and all stared directly at me. I got scared, so I immediately got in and went up to my room. Our hotel room was located on the fifth floor, so I looked down the window into the streets, but I couldn't see any of the figures. I remained extremely paranoid during the rest of our stay, but we never encountered anything similar. Even to this day, we haven't talked about the incident. This happened about four years ago, in December of 2015. Me and five of my friends have our own business editing photos and videos for social media content creators. And because of this, we tend to have a lot of spare time on our hands. We used to go on road trips to a local lake that has a few nice spots to camp at. 
and a ski resort. We usually went there on our days off. One week, the six of us finished all of our projects early, so we had a few days off. We decided to drive to the lake. I won't be using their real names for obvious reasons, so I'll call them Kevin, Stephen, Brittany, Katie, and Josh. Katie and Brittany rode in Katie's old sports car, and Stephen and I rode on our motorcycles. Usually, Kevin and Josh took Stephen's Jeep. But on this trip, Josh had just bought a new Sprinter van, which the previous owner had converted into a two-person camper. So Kevin decided to ride with Josh. When we arrived, we skied, had some really delicious camping food, and listened to Josh brag about his new van. It was a pretty normal trip. On the last day, we all packed up to head home. About two hours into the trip back home, we were a little hungry, so we stopped at a gas station to grab some snacks. We all parked our vehicles outside and went into the gas station together, which was kind of foolish. We were in there maybe four or five minutes, and the car's door was left open the whole time. When we came outside, we had a huge shock waiting for us. Josh's van was gone. There was a huge dent on the side of Katie's car and another dent on the side of an old truck in the parking lot, which I assume belonged to an employee. We were so panicked at that moment, so we immediately called the police. But since we were a little off the grid, the police took 15 minutes to arrive, and by then, we knew the chances of them being able to find Josh's van was slim to none. The scariest thing about it was that Kevin brought his work laptop on the trip and I knew that Kevin didn't have a password set up on it. We waited for another two or so hours while the police searched the area, but they couldn't find anything. They told us to go home, and they would contact us if they found the stolen van. Kevin and Josh rode with the girls in Katie's car, while Stephen and I rode our motorcycles, following them very closely. We didn't stop once during the remaining three-hour trip home. Fast forward two or three weeks later, we received a frantic call from Josh. He said that the police contacted him and that the van had been found. All six of us showed up to see the van, and the van had somehow been rolled on its side and was left in a ditch near the highway, about an hour from where it had been stolen. Once they got it out of the ditch and flipped it upright, the police let us look inside to see if we could salvage any personal items. Sure enough, Kevin's laptop was gone, along with a set of kitchen knives that Josh had used for making kebabs. The most disturbing thing, though, was that once we got the busted driver's side door open, we saw that both seats were stained a deep dark red in multiple places, and the dashboard had slash marks all over it. At that point, we were really afraid of the van. Josh let the police take the van for further inspection, but we never heard what happened to it, or who the blood belonged to. My name is Louis, and I live in Switzerland. This story happened five years ago during the winter holidays. It was an icy cold day, and the snow was falling continuously, so we had to warm the house all day long with the firewood, putting it into the fireplace. My dad told us all the time that we should take care of the firewood. However, for the next days, we didn't do anything but just played Nintendo. Eventually, we noticed late around 9 p.m. that we had run out of wood. Dad got angry. So, as a punishment, he sent me and my older sister to the local lumberjack who was famous in the area. His shop was located one and a half kilometers away from our house. He was a really tall guy with a long beard and wore a black and white lumberjack shirt as a classic lumberjack. Anyway, at first he seemed very talkative. We ordered two bags full of wood, which were about 50 kilograms. He said, Okay, hold on. It'll take about 15 minutes to cut and wrap everything. All of a sudden, my sister had to go to the restroom. He said that he would let her know where the toilet is, so she followed him. I was waiting for about 15 minutes, and then I noticed the place was silent. I saw neither my sister nor the man. I called my sister's name, but there was no answer. Then I got a message from my dad that if we bought the wood, 
then we should come home immediately. According to the local news, the police are looking for a serial killer in the village 50 kilometers from here. Dad also attached a picture and unfortunately, he looked very similar to the lumberjack. My heart dropped. I wanted to scream, but then he came with the bag of wood suddenly. He was smiling, but I could feel that something was weird. He looked joyful. Please ask me where's your sister, he said and winked at me. She's certainly not far away from you. Then I noticed the red stains on his shirt. I nervously opened a wood sack and the pink hair clip of my sister came out. I was full of anger. I grabbed a wooden bag with all my strength and hit the man. He screamed and fell on the floor, and I pulled out my pocket knife and stabbed him. Two or three many times. Suddenly I heard a loud scream out of nowhere. Stop! Lewis! It was my sister. That was a prank! She was crying. I, I couldn't think straight. My head was all messed up. What have I done? I killed the wrong guy. I dropped the knife and stared at his cold body. But then I recognized that I had no time. I knew that we had to get rid of this body quickly while we were still alone in the shop without employees or customers. So I quickly looked around and found a hidden room, which was locked. We kicked the door and pushed him inside. And we were about to turn on the light in the room to find a cover, but then what I found was a huge shock. The room was full of people who had been cut in several pieces, and the floor was covered with blood. The lumberjack was the real serial killer. We were so terrified that we quickly covered him with some fabric and then ran out of the shop. We ran home as fast as we could. My dad asked us what happened, but we couldn't tell our parents anything. Since that day, we always made sure that we keep enough wood before the heavy snow. And I'm still wondering if the police found all the bodies at that shop. My name is Melanie. This happened when I was six years old. In 1989, I lived in San Bernardino, California. One night, after watching my favorite TV show, I decided to sleep with my mom. I used to sleep alone, but somehow I went to her bed and she smiled at me. While I was sleeping with her, I had a dream that I was at a park. It was sunny, and there were a lot of big trees around. I was in the car and my mom was standing on the corner of the sidewalk. I struggled to open the door, but it didn't open at all. As I was pounding on the back of the car window, crying for her to help me, she just stood there, smiling and waving to me. Then I woke up, crying hysterically. Mom also woke up and rubbed my back, asking what was wrong, but I couldn't bring myself to repeat the horrible dream. Nothing. I told her and fell back asleep without any more bad dreams that night. After a year, we moved to Las Vegas, and I was getting ready to turn seven in a couple of weeks. My older brother, sister, and I went to the airport to visit my aunt who lives in Washington for a while. After finishing check-in, we went through security and got ready to board the plane. When I looked back at my mom, she was smiling and waving at me. It was the same way as in my dream. I couldn't dismiss the weird feeling during the flight. But despite the anxiety, we eventually arrived at my aunt's house peacefully. We were about to have a big party since my birthday was coming. And on my birthday, my mom called to greet me and said that she loves me. That was the last time I ever heard her speak. Everything was alright. I was so happy at the time. I was waiting for my mom to come over here and spend time with us. A few days later, my uncle told us to sit down in the living room, as he had something very important to tell us. I noticed that my older sister was sitting in the corner chair and was crying quietly. He proceeded to tell us that my mother was no longer with us. At first, I couldn't understand what he was saying. He then told us that she died from a car accident. 
There was nothing more devastating than that day. Everybody in the living room was crying with such piercing sadness. Now I've grown up, but I still have dreams of my mom smiling and waving at me. I hope this story urges whoever is watching this video to cherish your loved ones. Because it could be the last day you see or speak to them. My name is Gabby, and this story is my true experience. When I was 11 years old, my family and I moved to a big house in a tiny town. Our new house was located at the highest point, which was at the end of the town. When we bought the house, the owner explained to us that his wife had just passed away due to cancer, and that the house was very precious to her, so she never wanted to sell it. Still, the owner said the house was too big and lonely for him, since all their kids were grown up and already moved to other cities. However, during the final part of the deal, he suddenly changed his mind and didn't want to sell the house. But it was too late. The owner stormed out of the office saying that it was his house and that we were going to regret it. Anyway, this was during the time my dad was sent overseas because he was in the military. So my mom, my older brother and I had to live by ourselves for six months. During that time, we had really weird experiences. Sometimes we would wake up to the sound of a goat in our backyard. It would last the whole night. The next morning, we talked to the neighbors and asked if one of them had goats, but none of them did. So at first, we just decided to ignore the issue and leave it alone. Now, just for your information, our house design was kind of odd. Downstairs, we had my room, my brother's room, my soon-to-be-born sister's room, and a weird wide walkway that led to the backyard. And upstairs, we had a kitchen, living room, and my parents' room. The downstairs was underground, and the upstairs was technically the first floor. Anyway, one night, I decided to sleep with my mom, so I went upstairs with my brother. Later that night, we heard a sharp scream coming from downstairs. It sounded like it was my dad's voice screaming for help. He was calling all of our names. My mom rushed out of the room and was ready to run downstairs. All of a sudden, she stopped at the top of the staircase and looked at us with a weird expression on her face. But your dad is still in Colombia. How could he... And the next thing I saw was my mom abruptly falling down the stairs. That moment was so horrible. It was like someone pushed her backwards before she was able to resist. My brother called the police and I ran down the stairs to check my mom and see if she was okay. We struggled to bring her up the stairs, but we managed to make it to her room. When the police and ambulance arrived, they took my mom to a hospital and left two officers with us that night. I was crying the entire night and we were so afraid. Due to falling down the stairs, mom was injured, and unfortunately, we lost our new family member. The most chilling part was that they found large handprints on my mom's back, as if she was pushed by someone. This led to an investigation, but they had to leave the case open because no one was found in our house, other than the three of us. We all suffered and went through a hard time that year, especially my mom. She slid into depression. When she recovered, we moved the following year. However, more things happened throughout the year, but not as bad as the previous one. Just footsteps, broken plates, or similar stuff to that. We put that house on the market when we left, but no one has contacted us. One thing is for certain. I hope that we never have to go back to that creepy house again. I really, really don't want to go back.
It was late in the evening and I was driving on the highway. I was coming back home from my friend's party. I was so tired at that time, so I decided to check in at a hotel near the village. The hotel was not too big, seemed normal, but was kind of creepy. After finishing check-in, I got my key and the room number. My room number was 23. I walked to the hallway. As I was passing by the other doors, I heard a kid's giggling voice from the room number 20, which was located <laughs> just two doors away from my room. <laughs> I stopped walking, and I noticed that the door on this room looked different from the others. The door looked very old and it had a big keyhole, and it was big enough to peek inside the room. I was actually curious about the inside, so I looked into the room, and there was a girl who was sitting on the bed with her face down to the floor. I couldn't <laughs> see her face clearly because her hair was all covered. <laughs> She was wearing a white dress like the 1990s style, and it looked dirty. I thought it was weird, but soon I just disregarded it. So I headed to my room, locked the door, and just passed out. The next morning, I was walking the hallway again. I didn't know why, but I instantly had this feeling that I wanted to look through that keyhole again in room 20. So I stopped in front of the door and looked through the hole. But this time, I couldn't hear any sound and see the girl, though. All I could see was a whole red color. I thought maybe she saw me yesterday, that I was looking through the hole, so she probably covered up the hole with a red cloth or something. I thought that was childish, but cute. So I smiled, stepped back, and headed to the counter. Before leaving, I asked the lady at the counter, Hey, what's going on in that room 20? Why does the door look different and why that girl stays alone? She stared at me for a while and then began to talk. Oh, you mean the room number 20. There used to be a family who checked in that room when this hotel wasn't renovated before. The couple had a daughter and stayed in here for their vacation. But then they killed their daughter in that room. And when the cops arrived, the couple killed themselves too. But the weirdest part about it was, after that, lots of our guests told the staff that they saw the same girl who was wandering the hallways. And they all said that the girl's eyes were too red, as just like she was shedding tears of blood. What she told me shocked me. My heart was pounding and I couldn't even speak anything. Then what was that red thing? Was she looking at me through the door, just like I was watching her? That day, I saw him on one of my usual walks along the bridge. He was a tall, middle-aged man in a cheap-looking suit. I approached him carefully, not wanting to spook him. I asked, Sir? He turned around quickly with his face drenched in sweat. Who are you? He asked nervously. I answered with a smile. I'm Mandy. You should move away from here. It's pretty dangerous, I said, pointing to the edge of the bridge where he was standing. What are you doing here? He looked at me for a few seconds before speaking again. Oh, I come here often. It's quiet, so I like that. I smiled at him again. He then looked down at the water below. He also said that I really shouldn't be hanging out in a place like this. Your parents must be worried about it. He sounded calmer, but wouldn't meet my eyes. I spoke softly. Well, my parents know I'm here. They know I like to help people like you. He turned to me, and I looked at him without blinking. I knew that he wanted to jump. The look on his face changed to one of uneasiness. So he tried to say something, but nothing came out. It will hurt like nothing's ever hurt before. And it's just a fall, but the aftermath is even worse. His eyes widened and he shouted, Get out of here, kid. You don't even know what you're talking about. He sounded more alarmed than angered. 
I continued to look at him as he breathed heavily. Then I slowly pointed to the pictures and flowers attached to the railings just behind him. Actually, I do. He looked in the direction I was pointing, taking a few seconds to process what he was seeing. He then turned around slowly to look at me, pure horror on his face. How... how can you... At that moment, I knew I had saved him. At least for now. He stood there for a moment longer, frozen and unsure of what to do. Then he didn't say any words, simply turned around and ran as fast as he could. I dropped my shoulders and breathed a sigh of relief. I walked over to the railings and just sat there, looking at the pictures. We miss you, Mandy, was written on a big card decorated with hearts and flowers right next to my yearbook photo. Gone too soon, said another, surrounded by teddy bears, clothes, and lots of flowers. It all looked so pretty. My name is Mandy. I was 19 when I died, and now I try to help people live.